The SKS is somewhat iconic in the United States. It's been in the country being sold since I was a kid. I remember going to gun shows and these things were being imported from China primarily and they were uh, really affordable, less than a hundred bucks. You could find them for like $89. <laughs> and then the Chinese imports got shut off and the prices on the Chinese rifles started to go up. But then after the fall of the Soviet Union, we started seeing uh, former Comblock countries exporting their SKS rifles. So we got Yugoslavian, Albanian, Russian, uh, all sorts of different SKSs wound up be, uh, coming onto the U.S. market. But for the longest time, especially when I was a younger man, this was considered the ultimate survivalist rifle, and that's what they called themselves back in the day. Survivalists today, they prefer to be called preppers or something else. I don't know. I don't really walk in that community, although I know I've gotten chewed out online before uh, for, for calling somebody a survivalist. guess it's a dirty word now. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just going to say survivalist. I'm an old man. And so these things were really well regarded within that community because they were affordable, less than a hundred bucks. The ammunition was affordable, really affordable back then. So they could stockpile it deep. They could buy a bunch of the rifles. I knew people that would buy them two, three, four at a time, and they would pack them in grease and stick them away for a rainy day, just in case they needed a rifle. And this rifle today could still serve that purpose, but does it really compete now against other products that are on the market? Keep in mind when this thing originally came into the United States, it sold for less than a hundred bucks. That was far less than an AR-15. Uh, back in the day, I believe the first AR-15 that I got, my mom bought it for me as a birthday present and the, uh, the rifle was over $500. It was a Colt, I think it was 540 bucks. And so this thing was, you know, one fifth the price of that. So they were very, very affordable. So today, they're not so affordable. It depends on what model you're looking at. The Chinese rifles have become very popular. The Albanians, I've seen those things go for over $1,000. The Russian rifles have become very popular. And the question is, does it still make a sound decision as a survivalist or prepping rifle? Well, if cost is your only driving factor, then uh, probably not. You know, you can go buy a complete Palmetto State Armory AR-15 for 500 bucks. Uh, you can find a rifle like this, and I didn't find this one all that long ago. This is a um, Chinese import, and this one has most of the serial numbers matching. I checked all the parts on it. The only part that uh, I know is not original to the gun is the firing pin, because it says USA on it, and uh, that's probably because somebody replaced the firing pin. They either broke it or they got a slam fire because it didn't have a spring on the firing pin, and they put a lighter firing pin in there. But other than that, all numbers match on this gun, and you'll find that with a lot of the military SKSs. The stocks will have a serial number, the top cover will have a serial number, the receiver will have a serial number, the bolt carrier will have a serial number, the bolt will have a serial number. You know, they serialized everything. So if you're truly looking at it from a collector's perspective, you can check those numbers to see if you get an all matching gun. But a gun like this can still be had for less than 300 bucks if you shop around. If you drive around town, uh, I'm sorry, if you drive around the country and you don't stop at local gun stores, you could be missing out on some real gems. That's how you find rifles like this. And this thing on GunBroker would probably fetch five, six hundred bucks, maybe more, depending on how bad somebody wanted it. But I paid less than 300 bucks for it, and that wasn't all that long ago. So if you can do that, then yes, it still makes sense as a prepper's rifle from a financial standpoint. So I'm going to sh show you a couple of different SKSs that I have out here, and uh, you'll probably see these on the market. I just checked the internet before I came out to do some shooting today, and I know that Classic Firearms and AIM Surplus are li listing the Type 56 Chinese rifles that were built in the 60s, uh, you know, Vietnam-era rifles. Uh, they're listing them on their websites right around $399 to $400, bucks, depending on what condition the rifle's in. And so still, that's $100 bucks less than that PSA. And if you're a collector and you want a 1960-era's rifle that is a definite military service rifle and not something built for the commercial market, uh, you know, check out AIM Surplus. I was just on their website checking out some of their rifles. So, they typically load from a 10-round stripper clip. I've done videos on the SKS before, but I'm just shooting some Tula 122 grain ball ammunition out of it. They hold 10 rounds in an internal magazine. I do have some of the other variants that were commercial rifles, like the D models and stuff like that, uh, rifles that had detachable AK magazines. Then you had people that would really, really do what we call bubba the gun up. They would buy all sorts of Tapco equipment and replace the stocks and put 
replace the top cover here and put a 1913 rail or a weaver mount up here and change out the hand guards and, and, and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And really, they didn't care because back then it was a $100 rifle. Now, they're, a lot, they're worth a lot more money. So, especially if you have a really rare one. And by that, I mean a, a rare manufactured one from a, a country. What I do here is I get this thing all bound up or what? Okay, I don't know how many rounds I loaded into it. But anyway, so it's a, it's a really small, sleek little rifle. Uh, I, I know people that have used these to go deer hunting. They're very well suited for that. They're great uh, for storage. Again, if you're one of those guys or gals that is a, a prepper and you wanna get stuff uh, stored away and you want a few extra rifles, if you shop around, again, you might be able to find a few of these. Now, does it make more sense than AR-15? Probably not in today's world, but it certainly did back when I was a younger man. Got a challenge target down at 100 yards here. And we'll just do a little bit of shooting here with this Tula. I only loaded eight rounds. And so another thing when you find them, don't pass them up because they're missing their cleaning rod or don't pass them up because they're missing their folding spike bayonet or blade bayonet because I've bought several for a steal because they didn't have the cleaning rod or the bayonet. But if you jump on eBay or some of the other online sites, you can actually find original Chinese hardware to put the gun back to right. And right is having its bayonet in place. Many, many, many times I see these things for sale as used guns and they're missing the, the, uh, the bayonet and people just pass them by. And they're for sale for 250 bucks or $300. The bayonet is like a $30, $40 item. Last time I bought one, maybe even less than that. So, and the cleaning rods are readily available too, so you can put it back to right. So, let's take a look at a Russian rifle. This is one of the rifles that when the Cold War ended, I couldn't wait to get my hands on because having stuff that was made in Russia, Russia-made firearms, was very, very difficult when I was a younger man. And so, when I got the opportunity to pick up some Russian SKSs, I snatched them up. So, let me grab that rifle and show it to you as well. This is one of my Russian rifles. And this isn't a particularly great example, but this is an example of what would be an affordable Russian rifle. Now, the Russians are uh, kind of known for force matching serial numbers to try to make the guns more valuable. And this gun actually has that. The original stock number is X'd out, and then the serial number has been restamped into the stock. Uh, you'll, sometimes you'll see electro pencil. They actually stamped the serial number into the top hand guard here, where the, the gas piston is. But, you know, the numbers look good on the bottom of the magazine and on the back of the top cover and on the receiver. But it looks like some of the other small parts, uh, they, they force matched and then they would refinish the stocks. And this one is a perfect example of an export gun for the civilian market uh, that was Arsenal refinished. They just slathered them in black paint and sometimes even the bolts would be slathered in black paint. This one is a little prettier because it's, it's left in its original in the white condition, if I can not pinch my finger there. Uh, I also have ones that were Arsenal refinished where they slathered the bolt in black as well. And then I have a really nice example that is blued and doesn't have all the really poorly done black paint on it. But don't let that discourage you. A rifle like this, if you know what you're shopping for, can be found for a relatively affordable price still because you can talk to the person selling it, assuming they didn't pay too much for it, and say, hey, you know, this is an Arsenal refinish. This isn't worth what you might think it is because if it's truly original condition, it's worth obviously much more. But the Russians seem to collect, uh, command a slightly higher price. Now you'll notice instead of spike bayonet, we have a blade bayonet on this particular rifle. But once again, you can find these bayonets online should you find a rifle that lacks one. And um, yeah, I would say that mostly I've just seen the Chinese rifles lacking the bayonets. I think that was something that maybe, and I'm not saying this as a fact, uh, towards the end of their importation to try to get around some import laws, they took the bayonets off of them and then they wound up being sold on the market separately because um, the bayonet's considered an evil feature. So loading this one up again, I wish I would have brought some stripper clips to the house. They're back at Copper Custom. As you can still manually load them just by popping rounds right down into the 10 round magazine. 
to set them in and push much like you would an AR-15 magazine. Now the 7.62x39 has got great ballistics. The ammunition is still readily available and affordable. You can stack it high. Uh, you can actually still get good military quality uh, ammunition like uh, Golden Tiger, which is going to be lacquered and sealed. Probably the tool that I'm shooting here is more or less commercial grade ammunition. It's not lacquered. And it doesn't look like they've sealed the primers either. No, they haven't. So it's just commercial ammo. But you can still get good military service ammo for these rifles. The safeties are right there. So you can flip it off and it follows the contour of the trigger guard. If the safety's on, when you go to try to put your finger on the trigger, you're gonna feel it, you'll know it's on. All right, let's see. Now this is one of my better shooting SKSs. I really like this one. It's so windy out here today. I shoot at the hostage taker target at 100 yards. This one's zeroed really, really well, and I missed the uh, the hostage taker once. But yeah, these guns shoot really, really smooth. The recoil is really, really mild, and they're it's extremely easy to strip. I know you guys have probably seen it a million times. I'll field strip one here for you really quick and show you how to look for serial numbers if you're looking for one as a collector's piece. But if you're looking for one as a possible, um, you know, survival type rifle or a you know shiznit hits the fan type rifle, you know, don't. Don't concern yourself with serial numbers and what parts are original or not. Just make sure that it's in good working order. Check the bore, make sure it's not pitted because a lot of times uh, you will find that they fi somebody fired corrosive ammo through the guns and didn't clean the gun and the chrome lining isn't gonna save you. You can still pit chrome as well. So check the bores, check the serial numbers and just do a basic function check and you should be good to go. Very rarely have I ever seen an SKS that just wouldn't work. Uh, no matter how rough the shape was. I found an old Chinese Type 56 for sale where literally the gun was almost falling out of its stock. It flopped around in its wooden stock. And I found another Chinese stock for sale on eBay, I believe, and restocked it. And now it's a great shooting little rifle. So you're walking through the aisle of a gun store and you spot an SKS sitting there. What should you look for? Well, guys, there are a number of very desirable SKSs out there that were imported from different countries. I mean, some of the obvious ones are Russian SKSs, Chinese are very common, uh, Yugoslavian SKSs are very common, but there's some really rare ones like the Albanian that I mentioned, there's North Korean, East German. There are some very rare uh, rifles out there. Then there are commercial SKSs that were imported from China, like the D&M models uh, like that, that had different variations that are also very collectible. So I couldn't go through all of the different variations and what to look for on all the different models and makes and manufacturers. And I would probably miss the vast majority of them. There's an extensive list of SKSs that did trickle into the United States. But in general, you're gonna find Chinese SKSs. That's about that and Russians and Yugoslavians. But the most common that I find in my travels is the Chinese rifle like this one. And this is, I think, my last acquisition. I like to rescue these things, but I'm not gonna pay stupid amounts of money for them. They're not $500 rifles or above to me. They're not even $400 rifles to me. If I can get them for 300 or less, and if they're in good condition, I'll consider it. So this is a good example of what to look for if you're looking for just a good Chinese SKS. You'll notice that the Chinese like serial number things just like the Russians do and other militaries. So there is a serial number on the stock. You'll see it's not overstamped. It's the original number. That number should match with the number that's on the back of the top cover here, which should match with the serial number that's on the receiver, which should match with the serial number that's on the top of the bolt carrier here by where the stripper clip goes, the guide. And then if you flip them over, you'll find serial numbers on the bottom of the uh, magazine and on the trigger guard on the Chinese SKSs. Now, don't go taking guns apart in gun shops unless you ask permission. Uh, you can offend or anger the staff at the gun store, but on the Chinese SKSs, you'll find some serial numbers internally. There's another serial number that you'll find 
on the bolt itself. So let's take the rifle apart here really quick. This makes a very good rifle uh, for just about any purpose. Deer hunting, my kids love shooting it, ammunition's affordable, they're insanely reliable, and like I said, you can usually find them, or not usually, you can still find them for a good price. So to take it apart, make sure that the gun is empty. You can pull the bolt to the rear, it locks open on the last shot fired. You can also drop the magazine out of it simply by pushing this lever and that will release the magazine itself and its follower, okay? Make sure the chamber is empty, let that bolt go home because you don't want that spring compressed because we're gonna take this top cover piece off. You'll notice there's a little lever here by my finger. I'm gonna lift up on that, see how it goes in the up position. And once you get it up, kind of hold that for hold this top cover forward. It's under a little bit of spring pressure and pull this all the way across, it is captive. So you'll pull that all the way across and then you can take this off. Now this is one of the Bubba components. You'll find people replacing the original top covers with goofy contraptions with NC star scopes on them or pick rails and whatever. And this is a horrible place to mount an optic. Uh, if you want to mount an optic, uh, the SKS is probably not your best choice. Not saying it can't be done, but I wouldn't do it. Then you've got your recoil spring, guide rod. Then you have your bolt and carrier. Just pull that all the way to the rear. You'll see your carrier will pop right up and it'll lift out. That'll leave your bolt and the receiver. And if I wipe off some numbers and see if I can get it to focus for you, there's a serial number on the bolt as well. All right. So that's what it looks like on the inside. Pretty much for your standard maintenance, you don't need to go much further than this, but you can take the gas system out of the rifle if you want to. The uh, Russian rifles will have a lever on them, like an AK, that you can get uh, the slot on your bolt carrier on it and use it as leverage. Uh, the Chinese have, most of the ones I've seen anyway, if not all, have a little hole there for a bullet tip, and you can sometimes do it just with finger pressure. I got lucky. Now you'll notice that there's a detent right here. There's two of them, and this is important. You'll see the two detents right there, one and two. At the first detent, you can take the gas tube and piston out, and they fit pretty tight and get carbon caked. And this is a two-piece part. Inside is your gas piston, all right? But wait, there's more. Try not to drop that on the ground. There's another piston just inside here. And if you lift this lever up too far, pew, that thing's gonna go sailing out of the gun. So I'm gonna put my finger in front of it, rotate this lever up a little bit further, and see it just popped up and hit me in the finger. And then that's the second half of the gas piston, short stroke gas piston system that operates the rifle. Sometimes you'll get lucky, and in the trap door you will find get in there. Ah. Sometimes it'll pinch your finger really bad. You'll find a cleaning kit inside. And it's pretty much like an AK cleaning kit that the Russians would put in their buttstocks of their earlier rifles. And it's just a little trap door that's spring loaded. Just push it in there. Inside you'll find cleaning tools. You'll find a side adjustment tool, things like that. If you want your cleaning rod, drop your bayonet down and then you can take your cleaning rod out from its holder and use that to punch your bore. But that's it, that's, that's pretty much fully field stripped and putting it back together is just the reverse. I've rambled on long enough. Do I think that the SKS is still a viable Shiznit hits the fan type firearm? Absolutely. Deals can still be found. Ammunition is easily found. It's a great caliber. And um, yeah, they're also great collectibles, but I do think there are probably better options on the market these days. Things like I said, the PSA AR-15 is for 500 bucks. That's kind of hard to beat, but still fun rifles. Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter. There is a link down below. Also, please swing by and check us out at coppercustom.com. Thanks for 11 years of support, and we'll talk to you guys soon.